two exciting bits of news that might scare you. Uh, one is, uh, just, one will please you probably. I don't do PowerPoints, so uh, mainly because um, I find I do them and then after about slide two I drifted off into various other um, strands of conversation anyway, so I finally gave up um, actually doing them. And the other thing is I never really prepare what I'm going to say before I get up here, um, not because I'm worried about what I'm going to say, but because I'm ac I actually want to talk with you, not to you, because this is, um, I know what I know, um, I don't know what you guys um, and girls know, and I'm actually interested in sharing some of my experiences that might help you um, generate some different thinking and some different ideas. Firstly, can everyone hear me um, up the back there? Yeah? Good, I've got the thumbs up there. Uh, just quickly to know what you know, uh, I was talking to Dan, you did a session just before this one, um, and there's some enablers and some blockers, I think, the other. So uh, just a couple of you who were there for those sessions, just give me a couple of the things that you noted in that forum uh, workshop as a couple of blockers that you thought were were uh, relevant in this day and age and a couple of enablers. So who's who was there who's brave enough to interact with me? Yeah. Um, cost, time, and distance as barriers. Yeah. Cost, time, that was cost, time and distance as barriers and something that's obviously very relevant um, down here in uh, Gippsland where I grew up, uh, like Sam, I grew up in um, the far northwest of New South Wales in Narrabri, which interestingly enough is Australia's sportingest <laughs> town. And I was up there um, for the first time in about 30 years recently because my parents don't live there anymore and there are all these plaques and a big um, a big showcase to uh, Narrabri being Australia's sportiest town despite the fact nobody's usually heard it unless they're driving to Brisbane uh, there. So um, time, cost and distance. Yeah. And what are a couple of enablers, um, interestingly, that you came up? Do we come up with any? Who's got, yeah? Family friendly. Yeah, that's um, and a safe environment. Um, very interesting and um, I do, uh, as Dan pointed out, I sit on the board of the Melbourne uh, Football Club and we are hoping for a much better um, year this year, particularly thanks to any Hawthorne supporters in here. Yep, thank you very much. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing Jordan Lewis kick it down Jesse Hogan's throat all year. Uh, first training session I went to, for those who are interested, um, first ball Jordan got, he kicked it straight onto Jesse's chest and he said, you'll see a lot more of that this year, mate. So that was um, fabulous. So... Um, the, interestingly, the, I, I do a lot of um, talks. Interestingly, um, I was the CEO at Vic Sport with Julie, which is how I come to be here, and I've known Barry. I said to Julie, has he been here for 30 years? But she said, no, he doesn't think 13. it's th 13. That that's long. I left um, Vic Sport eight years ago. So um, I still do uh, some stuff with sport, but I work much more in the sort of infrastructure and city planning uh, space now where it really is. If you think sport's bad, um, I rarely go to a meeting where, A, I'm not the only female, um, so most of those meetings I am the only female and um, there aren't many of us who work in the high levels of infrastructure and I am probably the only one in there who is well under 50. Um, so it is a very different sort of environment to work in out there. But I want to tell you a couple of things that are, these are just my learnings and experiences. They're not necessarily right. They're not necessarily wrong. They're just things that I've learned in my time uh, working on boards and being in administration and having been an athlete um, myself. Um, I'm going to tell you something uh, that uh, will make sense and it won't make sense. Uh, the great advantage um, for women is that the playing field out there, wherever you go, whether it's a boardroom, whether it's an organisation, whether it's a sporting field, is exactly the same for men and women. Okay, so you're going to say that isn't right. We all live in the same world. Okay, so it's exactly the, um, the same. Um, so, and the reason I say that is I have absolutely no problem walking into a board meeting that's full of men um, when I chair the Victorian Regional Channels Authority, for example, and we're responsible for making sure a ship doesn't get stuck in the heads um, of the bay because if we get a ship stuck in there, then we're going to be in big trouble. So that's part of the job of that entity. I have no problem walking into that boardroom as a female um, with, a, with a group of men and they are all men that sit around the table, including the executive in that organisation, because I know my stuff. I know my governance. I know my shipping stuff. I don't know as much as our harbour master. I don't know as much as the guys who've been there for 20 or 30 years working on the water. But I do know how to chair a board meeting and I do know how to undertake good governance and that's what I'm there for. So I don't have any problem walking into that space as a female. And I'll give you a bit of advice. Young women in particular, they say this, what is the trick to being on boards? What's the trick to being confident? And I say, you know what, it is okay to wear high heels to the boardroom. 
it is okay to wear high heels to a meeting. It's okay if you don't want to. What I mean by that is it's okay to be yourself, okay? You don't have to be the same as everybody else. And the second thing I'm going to say is it's exactly the same for everyone out there. That's an advantage for women. And now I'm going to tell you it's completely different for women out there. And that's the other advantage that we've got, okay? So um, I walk into those meetings with um, the pale, stale male Brigade, um, brigade, and I say that lovingly. Um, they are, in fact, my, one of my um, closest and dearest mentors is a very well-known international um, infrastructure expert, and he is, um, you know, the best man that I know. He is absolutely fabulous um, as a mentor. So there are very good men out there as well. I walk into those meetings and as I said, I'm the only female in there potentially that they've come across in a position of authority in an infrastructure space and certainly the only one that is well under 50. So they do not know how to interact with me. They don't know what to do when a young female, relatively young female, walks into the boardroom and is competent and confident in their knowledge. And so I walk in there and go, they are just as uncomfortable as I am in this sort of situation. So how do I help put them at ease? doesn't mean I bend over backwards to um, placate them. It doesn't mean that I go in there and actually tolerate any of the rubbish. And I can tell you when these boardrooms, happens around the footy boardroom table, the boys get silly and they're not boys, they are men, um, older men too, but they act like idiots. And I just say, we're not having that sort of conversation in the boardroom. That's one of the good things about having a female there. We stop that kind of um, senseless chatter that goes on. Um, so it is an advantage. But I understand that they don't know how to interact with me. They don't know if it's okay to open the door for me. They don't know if it's okay to say, oh, you look lovely today. So it's, a, it's an exchange. We have to work together. And it's no different in the sporting arena. Now, I will tell you now, we are coming a long way very, very quickly very quickly in all walks of life. So not just the sporting field but in other other areas as well. We always have that conversation um, and I think I had this conversation um, on ABC this morning on TV about women not being as um, progressed in CEO roles or in various other roles. We were talking about our first Chief Justice female in I think 50 years of appointments which is crazy but hey we've got one there now. You think um, I cast my mind back to a conversation I had a few years ago with one of the first female master's graduates from Melbourne University. She was in her 60s so she was not old. So women were graduating from master's courses um, and we've only been graduating for 20 or 30 years from these courses. So if you put that in a time scale based on how long men have had the run of the workplace, we are coming very, very quickly. So I think it's not something that we should um, sit there and, and bemoan. I think it's something we should be proud of, the fact that we are coming first, uh, coming quickly. And we have to sit there and say, I, as, as a person um, who uh, take on some leadership roles now, I sit there and think, what can I actually do now to make sure I make it easier for the women who are going to come after me. So I can see up the front here a young lady who's quite a few years younger than I am and I hope will go on to be um, the president of a football club one day if you so choose to. Don't do what I've done. Get further than what I can. And we owe people like Jermaine Greer and the, the suffragettes, I owe them because they've made it easier for me to get where I go and I need now to do what I can to make it easier for women to get that little bit further. So if you put your mind as a female in that sort of context, whenever you're going into a situation that you think needs change, all of a sudden you start to view the situation completely differently. I'll tell you one, uh, one thing I know for sure, cultural change will not happen if you don't force it to happen. Things won't change if you just leave the status quo alone. People who are in position, so if we never came in and said, hey, we want women on football boards, we want women chairing infrastructure boards, we want a female prime minister. Couldn't quite get there in the US, but um, as I said uh, last time around when Obama got elected, I said they will vote in a black African-American man before they vote in a female in the US. They voted in Donald Trump before they would vote in a female. So it gives you a bit of a sense of where they're sitting in that unconscious bias space. But we have to do the work to help get the cultural change happening. 
because it just won't happen by osmosis. And, it, and you can sit there and say, let somebody else do it. I'm very happy to do it wherever I can. Um, and you can watch it happen or you can be part of the change yourself. Doesn't mean we can't have everyone chairing boards. There aren't enough boards around. We can't have everyone sitting on boards. But you can do something in your own space to make that cultural change. And I'll give you an example. I think there's a lot of this, um, there is intentional bias out there. Don't um, kid yourselves about that. There most certainly is intentional bias out there. It's not just a gender thing. Um, it's a race thing as well. It's an age thing. But we seem to focus um, on gender. That seems to be our sort of 10-year period at, um, at this point in time. We go through cycles where if you cast your mind back, and I know, Jules, we did this um, at Big Sport, you'd have a 10-year period where we focus on disability sport and then we'd have a 10-year period where we focus on, focus on Indigenous sport and then we'd have a 10-year period where we focused on women's sport and we have a 10-year period where we focus on multicultural sport. So we seem to go through these phases, but it's important that we remember bias is not just gender, but that's what we're talking about at the moment. There is a gender bias there, but I think that there's also a very strong unconscious gender bias. And if I can pick up Sam's golf um, analogy... I um, am obviously a reasonably strong female. I grew up on a farm. Um, I was expected to ride the horses exactly the same as the boys. I drove a tractor like the boys. I um, crutched the sheep like the boys. I horned the cattle like the boys. So there's none of this, oh, you're a girl, um, stay inside. We worked um, as hard as the boys. So maybe that's, maybe I get a bit of a different perspective from that. But um, having been an athlete, I was reasonably um uh, skilled at being able to put uh, hit a ball and I had the great fortune of having a couple of um, former European tour players uh, as very good friends of mine and they coached me and so I was a, a you know I'm a reasonable golfer and I can drive the ball okay so anyone who tells you drive for show putt for dough are people who can't hit the ball a long way because if you can hit the ball a long way that's it. Yes, I couldn't give a crap. It takes me four four putts to get the ball, ball in the hole from two foot, so long as I drive it 250 metres. <laughs> so we were at one of these um, corporate functions. There was a handful of women. There was probably three with the blokes, but I was quite happy to go out there. We got to the presentations at the end, and we're doing our little um, awards thing, longest drive, Kate Rocky. Yeah, long and straight, 245 metres or something, I think. Get my prize, whatever it was, and uh, next thing, oh, nearest the pin, and some guy, I'll point at you, Barry, it wasn't you, but I'll point at you, some guy says, oh, what about the men's longest drive? And the guy standing up and said, that, that was the longest drive. Now, he didn't mean anything by it. He just assumed that the women's, the women's drive would be shorter than the men's. And he came up, the guy who said that came up and spoke to me afterwards. He said, oh, I apologise. He said, I didn't do that. I just assumed that would, there would be a men's and a women's category, in which case, uh, or a men's and a longest drive category, a women's and a longest drive, in which case I would have won two prizes, which would have been quite good. But, <laughs> but the thing was, he didn't, he didn't necessarily mean that. He didn't mean, you know, what's a woman doing up there driving it? He just unconsciously assumed that the longest drive would be hit by a male. And that's part of that thing of actually teaching and actually helping understand um, that it's not necessarily meant to intentionally be derogatory or harmful. Some of these things are actually just misunderstandings. And like I said, going into a room of men who don't know how to deal with a young female executive um, is a learning experience and for them as well as me. And I want to talk a little bit about sport because we are here to talk about sport. And I'm going to talk about um, the AFL Women's League and I just want to give you a little bit of insight into um, uh, but realistically how that women's league came to be and the difference between a club like Melbourne and our involvement in it and um, Carlton, for example, or you, you could use um, Collingwood as well. So Debbie Lee, who is um, now our operations, um, head of operations for the women's uh, Melbourne Football Club women's team, when I was at Vic Sport 12 years ago, I think, um, Deb asked me would I come on a Saturday morning to a dodgy little lecture theatre in um, at Vic Uni to help the women's football league at the time there do some work around strategic planning and how they could actually develop their league. And I thought, oh, another Saturday morning, off I'll go because I want to help, help the women. There'll be a handful of people there. This lecture theatre was full of women who play Aussie rules. 
who'd given up their Sunday morning, I think it was, to come and actually try and, and build the league up. And this was driven by Deb Lee. And I was astonished at how many women had actually turned up to do something about promoting their sport. And that was 12 years ago. And this certainly wasn't the start of that thing. Debbie Lee pushed the Women's League for years um, by herself to a large extent um, to get marquee sort of matches up. And eventually Melbourne and the Bulldogs started playing um, matches against each other. So we'd play before the men's matches for the last few years and we'd draft from all over Australia. So we'd hold, eventually got to the point where we'd hold a draft and the women would um, come in. They'd fly in from interstate. It was a huge deal. You know, I was astonished and I'd go along to the draft and I was so excited when they got picked. And then we'd have two teams of women who played these marquee matches and they were very good um, quality matches. And I think as Sam was saying, when people went and watched they were astonished at just how good the quality was, how hard they hit each other, and this is going to be a learning experience for, for women who are playing um, in the current league that's starting up who haven't played AFL, because I'm like, girls, it is not like ultimate frisbee. Um, <laughs> you know, someone's not to, waiting there to, to rip your socks off um, when you're catching the, the frisbee. So it is going to be different. But these women are really, really highly skilled players. And I sponsored one of the women from WA because she would have had to pay for her own flight and accommodation to get over here to pay these, play these matches um, when we were having this um, small sort of inter-club league. From that, and really from this persistence of this one woman who was honoured with the AFL's um, highest award for her contribution and is so unassuming about it, she just wanted to get this league off the ground. We now have an eight-team league. And Melbourne and the Bulldogs, um, thankfully, are, are both um, start-up teams because they really did start this. And then we see a couple of teams um, from other um, Melbourne clubs and other interstate clubs who have joined the bandwagon for the wrong reasons. They haven't taken an interest in developing women's sport within their club. They haven't been part of this process of pushing and pushing to get things done. But when they saw a dollar sign and, and an opportunity to bring in women, they jumped on the bandwagon very quickly. Now, that's smart and that's a good sort of um, way to build your business. But it, it would be interesting to see how those teams actually come together um, during the season when you have one that is so much a part of our club. You know, at Melbourne, Daisy Pierce works at the club. She works with the team. Debbie Lee works at the club. They have been there and they've been building this club. We had a staff and, and families gathering to celebrate the women's um, team and that was the day before they started training and uh, we gave them a ring. So they all got a ring because Daisy's dad, uh, stepdad is a, a jeweller and Debbie had said we want to do something really special for the girls. They were stoked. You know, they were virtually crying. They had these rings and they were showing them and whatever. It, that's how we feel about our women's team. They're every bit as important as our men's team and that has been a cultural journey for us for years and it's fantastic to see it come to fruition. I will be interested to see how that transcends over time versus those that have sort of just bought in a team without having the culture around it. And if I can give you the classic example of how that one team um, attitude does make a difference, cast your mind back to the Big Bash, um, the, the 2020 cricket series um, that finished at the start of this year, so 2015-16 series. Both the men's and the women's league were won by the Sydney Thunder. They have a one-team culture. So there's no men's and women's team. It is one club, one team, one attitude towards everybody. Now, I'm not surprised that they actually came through and won both of those, both of those leagues. So in, in looking at where we're going with with women's sport and in enabling more engagement in women's sport, there's so many things that we have to look at. There's, I always find it impossible. People say to me all the time, what's the glass ceiling? Why aren't women getting there? And I say, well, who wants to get there, wherever there is? I'm not actually sure. I've been a CEO. I can tell you, if I can use a swear word in here, that is the shittiest seat in the house because you're stuck, you're stuck in the middle of nowhere. You've got a board above you. You've got members or or consumers or staff below you, you're, you're wedged in this thing, yet we all seem to be racing to this chair. So people say, 
um, the glass ceiling and I said, well, I'm not sure where where is, but anyway, if, if there's women who aren't getting there, put your hands up so we can understand why. Put your hands up so we can understand what the blockers really are instead of making assumptions. And I think it's the same with women's sport. Now, there are no doubt obstacles in the way because I know when I was at Big Sport and I think we spent some time down here with Barry working on the facilities issue because there just weren't women's change rooms at local AFL fields. Why? Because women didn't play. Those things were built in the 50s and 60s. So women didn't play then. So you don't build things that you don't need. That's, I'd say, as an infrastructure specialist, now that's a waste of money. So now we've got to change and we've got to go back and retrofit them. And that's where I say we have to change the culture in it. That means going back and saying they didn't do it deliberately. It just was the way it was. Then now we've got to go back and retrofit them. And, and the government at the time, um, James Molino, who was our sport minister at the time, put a lot of money into actually upgrading, in particular, country areas, upgrading facilities so women could play. But we need more of those sorts of enablers there. We do need more women on boards. So you become role models for the women who are going to come after you. And those who do follow the AFL and, and know Peggy O'Neill is our first female president at Richmond, having a bit of a hard time of late um, Peggy as a Richmond football player. Um, but speaking to Peggy, um, she's Canadian actually, so um, you know, grew up in a bit of a different culture to here. But um, she said, oh, and I always say this, we have uh, women's directors meetings. And I know when I started, I think there were maybe 12 of us, female directors, I've been on the board for four years. Uh, now we, we recently had um, dinner at, at uh, Jeannie Pratt's house, which is an, an advantage of having her on the Carlton um, board. It's a very nice house. And she has, don't tell anyone this, tell her I told you, she has her own in-house circus performer, an in-house magician. So go figure. Anyway, um, <laughs> she's got an in-house magician, but we didn't get to see the magician over dinner. But uh, we went to dinner uh, there, and I think there's now 36 I think it is um, female directors on football boards. So it's getting it's getting better over time, even in that brief time I've been on the board. And I was chatting, chatting to Peggy and, and they always say, oh, it'd be so nice when we're not acknowledged as the, the first female or the thing. And I was like, why? As I said to my AFL women who are playing, I said, no matter what else happens, you will always be first. You will always be the first females that play for this football club. And they went, oh, no. I said, I've never thought of that. And I said, so that's a badge of honour. So I said, carry that with you and bring home that cup as well <laughs> when you come. But um, if you're going to step in these roles, and, you know, I, I spoke a while ago um, to Andrew Dimitro about uh, being a CEO of an AFL club. Um, and he said, oh, you'll have to go through, you know, the AFL you know, sort of branding experience. I said, no, thanks very much. But um, you know, the first female CEO of an AFL club has to realise, go in with very open eyes, realising that you are now the ambassador for women's sport. That is going to be such a high profile public figure. You will be asked to speak at every single event, whether it's equity, women in the workplace, men in the workplace, sport. You're going to spend 90% of your time doing media and speaking engagements. Um, and not your actual job in the office, which is hard enough. You, you absolutely have to go in knowing that is part of your role. Because if you don't go in with your eyes open to that, you're going to feel like you're getting hounded and oppressed and, and suppressed every time you do anything. So that's when I say be aware that you are women here who can make a difference. And the fact that you are here on a Wednesday night shows that you do want to make a difference. And and I should in particular say thank you to the men um, who are here because um, it is equally important that we bring men on this, this journey with us. We're, not, we're with you, not against you. But women who are here, you've got to be really aware that you can make a difference, but you've got to have the courage to get up and do it for a start, which means you've got to stick your head above the parapet. And what happens when you stick your head up? Someone wants to shoot it off. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter why. You know, I think people always bag politicians and I worked in federal politics for a while. I was like, that is the hardest job in the world. If you're trying to do good, doesn't matter what you do, at least half the population disagrees with him. So you, you're putting, you're setting yourself up to get shot down all the time. But, you know, I have the greatest respect for them having most of them for having a, having a go and actually putting their hand up. So if you're going to put your hand up and do put your hand up um, because it's really important that you do and it's really 
you know, it's fabulous when you get to stand up and speak at these things. You know, I love, you know, I love coming and speaking, particularly down in um, areas outside the city where you, you, time and distance is a, it is a problem for you. So I think I'm quite often down here in Terrell and speaking at things because I think it's important that we, we do share those experiences. But put your hand up, so have the courage to do it, and then have the resilience to get up again when you get knocked down a hundred times. And that's the second thing. It's the first thing you learn. I play volleyball, so maybe that's why um, we were always up and down. But it's the first thing you learn, you know, get up again, get up again, get up again. And that's the other thing you've got to take with you. People, no matter what you do, will try and knock you down. You'll fall over yourself sometimes, but you've got to get back up. You've got to get back up. And I know I'm out of time, but I'll finish with another AFL story. Bev Knight, who was the first female on any AFL board, um, Essendon board, she told me a story. I said, what was your first board meeting like? And she said, oh, horrible. She said, I actually went home and cried afterwards. She didn't cry at the meeting. So I went home and cried afterwards and I thought I'd never go back because she walked into that boardroom and there were the men milling around and doing their man things they do. And in she came and they had uh, name uh, places on the table and they actually, uh, the chair said, we'll call the meeting to order. And uh, they waited until Bev I went over and took her seat and then the trim on either side of it picked up their name tags and moved them to the other side of the table to very clearly say, you're not welcome here, this is not your domain. She said, she progressed through the board meeting, bless her. She went home, she said, I cried. She thought I can never go back in there and she said, no, I, I am going back. And if she hadn't have gone back, then I probably wouldn't be sitting on the board now because it would still be a very closed space. So think about what you can do to chip away at that little path that many, 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 many people before us have forged already. I think that's, I think I wasn't even looking at Julie, she was giving me the five minutes, but I, didn't even know. <laughs> but I think that's time.